Meet the GMK Tech M8 Mini PC. It's small, cheap, and Ryzen powered, but can this deliver? Let's find out. Welcome to Team Pandora. Subscribble. This is what came a box from GMK Tech. We weren't paid to make this video, but they provided the mini PC so we could give you guys a deep dive and give you our honest thoughts. So let's get in there. Ooh. So our first thoughts, it's actually a very small and tidy unit, and it seems to use the same case as the Evo X1 we reviewed last year. Should be some more stuff under here. Like this card, that houses the multilingual manual. To be honest though, there's not really that much information in here, just specs, how to turn it on, and simple things like that. Either way, your language should be in here. At the bottom there are two more boxes, and this one has a 1.5 meter HDMI cable, a power cord, and as we're in Japan we get the US version, which has a grounding wire, and this is the smaller version of a kettle lead. And we also have a warranty card, in case anything goes tits up. Let's take a look at the other box. In here we have a switching power adapter. It uses a DC jack, rated at 20 volts, 5 amps, giving you up to 100 watts of total power. So this is what you get in the box, but let's take a look at the specs. The GMG Tech M8 uses a 6650H, a 6-core 12-thread CPU paired up with the Radeon 660M. The GMK Tech M6 had a similar spec, however here there are a few huge differences. This one has soldered on LPDDR5 memory, an inoculum port which opens the doors to AAA gaming when paired up with an eGPU. 16GB of memory should be ok for normal tasks, but it may become a bottleneck if you want something to game with. As for the price, the M8 with 512 storage is currently selling for $360 on a limited time sale and the 1TB version is up for 390 If you don't have this item on your Amazon store, you can always check out the GMK Tech website. They sell worldwide, and sometimes sell for cheaper. We've left you affiliate links down below if you want to help out our channel at no extra cost to yourself. So here's the M8, and as you can see it's very presentable. Its metal case gives it a premium look, and it should fit anywhere. Yeah, it's quite nice. As mentioned earlier, the case is exactly the same as their EVO X1, where it mixes metal with this black piece of plastic here. And there's also plenty of holes to aid in cooling. On the front we have the quick start guide for the Oculink, as well as the port over here. That's for the eGPU. Also got a fully capable USB 4 port, and a couple of USB 3.2 Gen 2s. Here's the 3.5mm audio jack, a pinhole for BIOS reset, and the power button. Clicks. There's gaps for cooling at the top and the bottom, and this also carries on to the side. With more holes. Yeah. Cheese grater. Mm -hmm. Moving to the back now is where all the action is. Well, it would be if the sticker wasn't covering everything up. This here basically says not to connect to the network on first boot, and we definitely agree. There's a USB 3.2 Gen 2, USB 2.0, HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort 1.4, a couple of 2.5 gig Ethernet LAN ports, DC in for power, and Kensington. Kensington? Yes. And let's move on. On the left side we have more air holes for cooling, which is continued underneath. And these feet in each corner give enough space for air to flow. They're roughly around 7mm tall, and they have rubber on the end so they don't slip around the desk. It's about time for the size comparison. The M8 is a smallish, tallish mini PC, measuring up at 7cm in height and 11 in width and depth. If that makes no sense, here it is compared to a Game Boy Pocket with a burnt screen, a copy of the worst version of Outrun, one of my oatmeal cookies, yum 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 yum, yum. a Japanese Mikan, the Devoom TV2, and a Roybosh tea bag. The GMK Tech M8 is almost four tea bags big. As we said earlier, the M8 actually does use the same case as the Evo X1. All of the ports match up, but unfortunately the M8 did not come with a metal stand so you can't place it vertical as intended to the original design. So if you do want it vertical, you better make your own feet. On first boot, we're greeted to the Windows setup screens. This process only takes a few minutes, we just need to select our language, location, username, uncheck all of these boxes, and then we're pretty much in. There's no need to connect to the internet at this point, or even log into Microsoft, which is great as we like to check for viruses beforehand. As you can see, the specs check out, and we're on Windows 11 Pro 24H2. Windows is automatically activated as soon as we go online, 
But first, we like to do a virus check. Both Defender and Malwarebytes report we have a clean computer, but before we go online, we decided to do stop updates and debloat the system. You can check out our video guide to see how it's done, and if you use Windows 11, this is a must do to keep Microsoft from spying on you. As to what the system is capable of, usual tasks like internet browsing, no problem here. And these socks look incredible. For schoolwork or office tasks, this computer handles it all without breaking a sweat. But if spreadsheets aren't enough for your creative side, this computer handles Photoshop or Krita without any trouble. And it should be good for audio production too. Just keep in mind that if you're layering dozens of tracks and VSTs, 16GB of RAM might struggle. So if this or video production are your goals, we recommend to look for a computer with at least 32GB of memory. And here's YouTube in 4K. Very nice. So let's get to the benchmarks. On paper, this has identical speeds to the 6600H, with additional management tools and the, quote, benefits of Microsoft Pluton security. But as you can see, it clearly lags behind that, probably due to the different memory configuration. Other benchmarks show similar results, falling a bit short of the M6. But don't forget, this machine has Oculink, opening the doors for AAA games with the external GPU. We've got pretty decent speeds for the stick of PCI 3 before storage, and we have fairly good speeds from the Wi-Fi chip, with no drops from both 5GHz and 2.4GHz bands. We then connected our Pro 3 controller via Bluetooth, so let's test out some games. We'll first start off with some 2D titles, and as you can see, this handles them with ease. Mother here. Excuse me? She starred in a film of mine last night, and she was definitely not. As long as the games don't use any advanced video effects, we're good to go. Dave the Diver is one we always like to include in our reviews. 1080p runs swimmingly, but at 4K, not quite. Rocket League, 1080p high. We saw a solid stable frame rate of 70 to 80, and we left VSync off to see if the RAM would thermal throttle. Even after several matches, we didn't see any slowdown, so it's safe to say that this machine handles the heat pretty well. Next up is Fortnite, 1080p, far high settings. We're using the performance renderer here, and for the drop off, we're hitting around 50 FPS. Sure, it's not the best, but once we're landed, it is pretty playable. Next up is CS2, and we're at 720p low with FSR off. While it's certainly playable, it can get a little choppy during intense moments. That's probably due to memory limitations. Here's Tenet to be low. But 1080p medium is probably the sweet spot for this machine. Ow. He's on the roof. Where 1080p high gives us around 40 FPS. When it comes to AAA titles, this machine does struggle. Running Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p low, the performance just isn't there. To fix that, we hooked up an eGPU via the Oculink port. But surprisingly, the results were still poor. Worse even. It reminded us of the issue we had with the Boss Game M4, where the eGPU via Oculink was being power limited. Where we sorted that was to use the Universal x86 tuning utility. In here we just set the values to 120 watts, which is the power our GPU should be getting, and then we got the speeds we're expecting. So, even at 4K. JBJ. Yay. Enough of the games, let's move into the BIOS. In here we're greeted to the usual power mode select, where we can change system TDP to 28, 35 or 40 watts. This is pretty unusual though, as AMD's specs state that this should be at 45 watts. Moving on we can toggle TPM, change the fan settings from auto to some kind of manual mode, but to be honest, we'd appreciate something with a bit more hands-on action, for example changing slopes and things like that. There's Wake on LAN, USB boot, and we can change the VRAM setting. As there's only 16 gigabytes in the system, we recommend either using two, three, or just leave it at auto. 
In the memory configuration we can adjust speed, just in case our memory gets toasty, and we can underclock. In the CPU settings there's nothing really of note, but in the security tab we can select secure boot, just in case we want to play Valorant. And if you want to use Linux, we can turn on fastboot, plug up a USB drive, and boot up Batacera. We're using the current version of Batacera 42 here, we can pair up our Bluetooth controller, connect to our home Wi-Fi network, and then emulate some arcade. When it comes to older titles, it's pretty much smooth sailing, and it can even run later systems such as the Sega Model 3. Or home systems like the Commodore Amiga, running at full speed. This game here is the AGA version of Nigel Mantle's World Championship, and it has more colours. Whatever that means. Andy Crane. And how could we forget Jim Power? We can upscale some PSP titles to 8x resolution. This one here is Valkyrie Chronicles 2, and it's working full speed. You're through! But if you wanted to play some games that need to push effects without dips, a more sensible value of 5 or 6 would be ideal. As for PlayStation 2, upscaling 4 times to give us 1440p resolution gives us around 40 FPS, but this is one of the most difficult games to run. If we upscale to 1080p, we're almost to full speed, but with a few dips. So the sweet spot for this game is 2 times resolution, giving us 720p. Moving now on to the higher tier, here's some Tekken Tag 2 on the Wii U. And it runs great! And some PlayStation 3. 720p, full speed. So let's move on to the noise and temps. In the balance mode we're at 41 degrees idle, and it's fairly quiet. And it pulls around 9 to 10 watts from the wall. In game it gets a bit hotter, giving us around 76 degrees on the CPU, and also a bit more noise. And it pulls around 54 watts. If we change to performance mode, it doesn't change much. Still same temps, and same noise. Pulling around 56 watts. Now in the BIOS we can adjust it to maximise fan speeds, and this will show the worst case scenario. So, let's see what's inside this thing. There are no obvious screws, so to get it open we need to twist off these four feet. Then we can pull out the metal cover. Now there are four positive screws we need to remove. And we can just pull up. But we need to be careful as there's a fan connected. Ah, so here we can clearly see the storage in the Wi-Fi chip. In here is an air disc, and if we want more storage we can add another one right next to it. Both 2280 in length. If we look down here we can see the Wi-Fi chip, and it's a MediaTek MT7922. Wi-Fi 6E. Here's the case fan, and it's a 70mm one, branded by GMK Tech. But to get further, let's remove the storage, and the Wi-Fi chip. Then we need to remove the header board for the Oculink, and these four hex standoffs. There are two notches at the side of the case, and it's designed to just slide out, very much like the Evo X1. In that video review, things got a bit heated, and I paid the price with my fingers. But this time, instead of unclip the case, we pushed the whole board through. Oh yeah. Ah, my fingers do hurt a bit though. From then on, there were two screws to take off the fan, as well as this cable. And then four more posi screws that hold the heatsink to the CPU. And there it is. While this was a complete faff to open up, at least now we can do some maintenance by replacing thermal paste. 
We've done a deep dive on thermal paste before, but for this unit, I'm going to use PCM7950. This mini PC is a bit of a project to take apart, so I want to use a face chain solution that's going to last. Now with that done, our system is around 5 degrees cooler, and a little quieter too. So, it's about time for the pros and the cons. The GMK Tech M8 is a great value mini PC, especially in the current climate of rising memory prices. It is quite small, looks great on a desk, and it has good thermals. The Oculink port with an eGPU allows us to convert it to a tiny gaming rig. We can add another stick of storage if we need to, and it works great as an emulation device. As for the cons, this runs slightly slower than we expected it to. It could be due to TDP settings, or possibly the memory. As there are two smaller fans in here, it gets slightly noisy under load, and it's an absolute ball ache to open up. The M8 is obviously a product that is aimed for students and families, and they're betting that if you really do want a game, you can get an eGPU. While we do agree with that, we reckon that if your mind is set on gaming or production on the cheap, we'd recommend their M6 Ultra, or if you need that eGPU, their 8-core M7, with the ability to upgrade the memory. Look, if the budget is incredibly tight, this is a solid win. It's far from perfect, but for the price, it beats almost everything else in its bracket. Summary! From 359, impulse buy, tiny box caught my eye, rising hard in a metal shell, with a little plastic, looks too good to work this well, clean little build, looks real neat, memory is rising, but this stays cheap.